Bible, Genesis 42 is where I want you to take your Bible, maybe hold that spot and go to Romans 8, 28. I'm going to be in both of those spots today, and as you look up on the screen, you will see the title of our message this morning, which is Living the 710 Split. Now, I have preached this title before. Uh, I've revamped this message for sure, but if you've ever bowled and you've ever been in that situation where the 7-10 split is, where you got one pin all the way to the left and one pin all the way to the right, you either got to aim at one or you got to aim at the other, but you cannot aim at both. And, you know, if you're lucky, you hit that 10 pin just right and it bounces off the back, comes out, takes out the seven and you get your spare, but you still have to aim at one or the other. And what we're going to do today is talk about our problems and how we approach those problems. And who here doesn't have problems? You know, I mean, obviously, if you're you're here today and your life is hunky-dory and everything's perfect, you probably should take the stage then because uh, that's not my life. Matter of fact, Job says it this way, man is born of a woman, is a few days, and full of trouble. Now, who couldn't relate to that? Like, seriously, how many people can go, yeah, I really don't know what he means? I mean, it's our life, right? I mean, when we look at things and about our problems, what's your problem? I mean, is it financial? I mean, given the current state of the economy, I'm sure even if you're doing good, you're probably not doing as good as you were. Health, maybe that's your number one issue. You got health problems. Maybe it's marriage. Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's a divorce on the verge. Maybe you got marriage issues. Maybe it's your kids. Everybody can see how they drive you nuts. Maybe it's your parents. (laughs) You know, maybe it's just your family in general. Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's a job. Maybe your house and your car is falling apart. Maybe you have mental uh, situations that you're going through. But who here can say, I don't fit in any of those categories? That we all have problems that come to our life. The question isn't whether we're going to have problems. You're going to have them. But the question is, how do we deal with those problems? And we've got to ask ourselves, and I'll quote Captain Jack, is the, prob- the problem is not the problem. The problem is your attitude about the problem. And that's what I really want to get down to. That we're all going to have problems. We're all going to face issues. And I don't care if you call it a problem, an issue, a situation. My Uncle Frank used to say, I don't have problems, I have situations. You can name it whatever you want to. Drama. You ever notice that certain people's lives are even worse than others? And if you boil it down, it's how we're dealing with those problems that escalate them or exaggerate those problems in our life. That's, That's the reason why some people can go through life having the exact same problems and not have so much the stress because of how they deal with them. And as Christians, with a perfect book in front of us, we should be able to know how to deal with these problems and know how to handle them and understand what they're there for. You know, the book of Proverbs 4.23 says it this way. Now, I want, you, I want you to think a little bit here this morning. He says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Oh, I'm having issues. Oh, that guy's got issues. Okay, we use that as a terminology for problems and troubles. And most of the time when I'm preaching Proverbs 4, 23, what I do is actually go to this verse and show that how our heart is desperately wicked and we create these problems in our life that actually stem from a heart issue in our life. And that's true. But I also want you to look at it from a different angle this morning that maybe God's saying, no, the issues of life are from your heart attitude towards your problems. In other words, how am I actually dealing with those marital issues, those 
house issues, those family issues, those health issues, those financial issues. Maybe my attitude will determine how that works out. And maybe if I change my attitude, even though the problem doesn't change, the circumstances does. And it's just all how we approach. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so when somebody says, well, I've got all this drama in my life, maybe you're the drama. Well, all these problems are coming at me. Maybe you're the problem. Maybe the problem isn't the problem. Maybe your attitude towards the problem is creating a bigger problem. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to decide that. That's, that's between you and the Lord. But I think it'd be good for every one of us to do some self-inventory into our life and look at how we are and realize, hey, how my reaction to this action may be creating bigger problems in my life. You know, Proverbs 25, 28, we live in a society that the anxiety level, and this is a fact, you can go online and look at it, the anxiety level in the average teenager is equal to that of the average mental patient in a sane asylum in the 1950s in this country. And most of it stems because what we have taught people is to let your feelings out. Now, feelings are great. Emotions are great. Listen, there's nothing wrong with having emotions. God gave us emotions. It's through those emotions that we show love to other people and kindness and, and all that and, and righteous indignation. All that's great. But emotions that are not bridled create problems. Now watch this. Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit. Do you understand? If you understand body, soul, and spirit, your emotions stem from your spirit. And what happens is, is when you get that out of control, and we've got massive anger from people, or massive uh, sorrow where people are just crying all the time, at some point, guys, emotion needs to get checked you and I need to be able to look at our emotions and say, you don't get a vote in this. The problem at my situation or at my hand that I have to deal with cannot be dealt with from an emotional standpoint. It needs to be done from a biblical, logical standpoint. How do I deal with this issue? Because if, if I just let my emotions go, what does it say? I'm like a city without walls. I have no protection. And this is why we see people in our society today losing their ever-loving minds. And you're going, what is this all about? Listen, guys, I get it. We get bad breaks in life. You know, you guys have heard my story growing up. I could use that and sit in a corner and just cry all the time or use that same problems I grew up with as motivation to make sure I do better for the next generation coming up. It's the same way with you. Whatever your bad situation is, we allow history to come back into our life and deal with current problems. And instead of going, let me control that. Well, I'm mad at my dad. Okay, you probably may, you may even have a reason to be mad. But you better learn to get that under control and deal with these logical situations from a biblical standpoint. Now, here's a guy that I like to listen to on his podcast. Some of you may know him. Uh, this is Jocko. He, he, uh, he goes around now. He's about 53, I think he is, 52, somewhere in there. He was the leader of SEAL Team 3 in Iraq. So Chris Kyle worked under him. And now he, you can see him on Joe Rogan. If I need motivation and I feel like I'm getting lazy in life, I listen to this guy, because afterwards, I, it just gets me rolling. And so he has this statement, and, and you're going to play that from here, or yeah, you go ahead and play it. I want you to listen to how he looks at problems, and then I'm going to discuss that and go into the scripture with it. Go ahead. So notice, he's not saying it's good 
that those things happen. But what he's saying is the mindset to approach those problems has to start with good. Okay, good. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it this way. Good. I'll deal with it that way. Now, now, you may think it's a little crazy, but just hang on. I'm going to Scripture with this. Chuck Swindell, who was a pastor in California for years and then moved to um, Frisco, uh, Texas, and had a massive church, he had this statement, and I've used it for years. It says, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on my life. Attitude, to me, is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day we cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% on how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. And yet, we listen to this and we think, or say, oh yeah, I get it, I get it. No, that's where everything is stemming from. The exact same thing can happen to two different people and one person's attitude is different and it goes better. And that goes back to what Jocko was saying. Fine, set the attitude right, then move forward. And in all these bad things that are happening, good can come out of it. But it's going to start with a heart attitude of how we approach our problems and our trials and our troubles. Now, let's move to the Bible and see what God has to say about this. All right, so we got a story over here in Genesis 42. And to bring it kind of up to the context speed, we have a situation where Joseph, the dad's favorite son, has been sold into slavery by his brothers Ends up in Egypt, he's the number two man, and God is going to use him to save his whole family. So he ends up over there, famine comes in the land, Jacob tells his boys, y'all go down into Egypt, they got some food down there, and so they all got bags and they got money in it, they go down, they meet with Joseph and don't even know that it's Joseph. And he's like, hey, uh, you got some brothers, right? You got another one, right? Yeah, we got a littlest one with our dad. He's like, go get him and bring him here. And matter of fact, for collateral, I'm going to keep Simeon. So he's got Simeon. Then he puts corn in their bags and puts their money back and sends him back to go see their dad. They get there and they're like, Dad, uh, here's the situation. Uh, there's this guy who's running the show who wants the younger brother to come down, and he kept Simeon for collateral, and we opened up our bags, and it looks like we stole all the corn. So here's where it picks up. This is, it says, And the man, the lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, and take food for the famine of your households, and be gone. And bring your youngest brother unto me, and then shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men, so will I deliver you, your brother, and ye shall traffic in the land. And it, sh and it came to pass, as they emptied their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in the sack, and when both they and their father saw the bundle of the money, they were afraid, and Jacob, their father, said unto them, now here's where he's going to go to speak. Notice his first word, me. Most of our problems in life come because we're self-centered. It's me. Why me? Why am I going through this? Why'd you do this to me? Now notice, me, have you bereaved of my children? Joseph is not. You know what he's saying? Joseph is dead. Right? Simeon is not. And now you're going to take Benjamin away from me? Now notice what he says. All these things are against me. 
Now, let's contrast that with the Apostle Paul, who's been shipwrecked, beat, whipped, jailed, stoned, and actually killed and brought back to life. Now, if you don't believe that, go study Leicester and Derby and understand how he got to the third heaven. But that's a whole other story. He actually went through some bad stuff. And you know what his attitude was? It's all working for the good. Now notice this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them whom are called according to the, his purpose, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Here's Paul that has went through some horrible stuff who could legitimately say, oh, I'm against, all these things are against me, but he's going, no, this is all working out. This is all going to go good. He's the original Jocko. Oh, beat on? Good. Jailed? Good. Because what he was doing was taking that same concept that, oh, I'm shoved in jail? Good. Now I'm going to witness to somebody here. Oh, I can't go into that city? Good. I'll go to this city over here and witness to somebody. He always found the good in it. Jacob, on the other hand, is going, all these things are against me. And yet, this is what I want to do. I want to take the rest of our time to ask you, when it comes to your problems, are you Jacob or are you Paul? Are you thinking that everything is against you in life? Listen, I've been there. I'm not, I'm not up here pointing a finger going, you, you guys just don't got it figured out like I do. I live in the same boat as you do. And then it seems to, when problems come, it seems to be piling on and you're like, why? Now watch. James says it this way, and you guys have heard me say this for years. You know, a lot of Pentecostal churches run around here going, well, how you know you're really walking in the Spirit is you'll speak in an unknown tongue. And the Bible doesn't say that. What the Bible says is how you know you're really walking with God is when you can count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, in other words, different problems come to your life and you still are joyful through it all. God says, now you know what it means to walk in the Spirit of God. Then he says, listen, all these problems that happen to you in verse 2, verse 3 says, know this, that the trine of your faith worketh patience. Now Justin just spent seven weeks to talk about this stuff. That in order to get patience, you, what, what, what step comes before patience? Oh, good night. Glad he ain't here to hear this. Temptation. Being tempted. Right? Temperance. Okay? So the bottom line is in order to get those patients, we got to go through the trials. And God says, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm, I'm sending all those problems your way for. Because I'm trying to temper you. I'm trying to make you into the conformity of looking like my son. That's what Romans 8, 29 is talking about. Look at verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect in entire wanting nothing. Well, how do we get to a place of patience in our life? Trials, problems, troubles. No one learns patience when life is going great. No one learns to be tempered when everything's going awesome. Now, first Peter says it this way. Because, you know, when troubles come our way, the first question we ask is, why? Why is this happening to me? Okay, Paul said, or Peter says it this way, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing is happening to you. So when these problems hit you this week, and they'll come, don't sit around and go, well, that's weird. I thought if I came to Jesus, everything would be great. There's people that actually preach that trash, by the way, who have never read church history. Don't come to Jesus to get a better life. Come to Jesus to get a better eternity. Because your life may stink. All right, now watch. Here's where we're going to start. Number one, if you're, a, if you're a Jacob, you're focusing on the problems. If you're a Paul, you're focusing on the promises. Watch this. Here he is. He says, all these things, and you know what the things are? All the problems. 
His focus was all these things are against me. His focus is on the problems. But you go to Paul, he says, know that all things work together for the good. His focus is on the good. And so maybe your approach should change to the problems. And quit focusing on the problems and start focusing on the promises that God is trying to, in verse 29 of that same chapter, have you, pre, or have you conformed to the image of his son? Now, notice here, 1 Peter 1.17, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried in the fire, might be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So one day when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, your whole world's going to be unveiled and you're going to be judged and you're not going to be judged for your sin that was judged on Calvary. What you're going to be judged for is your work in the Lord and your walk within the Lord. And a lot of our walk stinks because we don't approach it the right way. And God's saying, listen, all those problems I put you through, I did it for my own glory. Because I wanted you to bring me glory through all of that. By the way, maybe our witness to the lost people would go better if they could actually see people who say they know Jesus Christ handle problems differently. I know lost people handle problems better than a lot of Christians. And you're going, well, how's that? Now, Isaiah said it this way, 40, Isaiah 45, verses 2 and 3. He says, I will go before thee, and I will make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass, and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness, and hidden riches of secret places. Now, now isn't that interesting? That's a promise. You know what that promise is? I'm going to give you treasure when you're in darkness. You will learn more about God in trials than you ever will on the mountaintop. Oh, it, it's easy, guys, to walk in here when life is going great, raise our hands, sing the praises of the Lord, tell everybody how awesome they are, listen to Justin or myself or Jerry or whoever. Go home, shout amen. This is all awesome, isn't it? Let tragedy hit your life. And things change. All of a sudden, God becomes real. We spend a lot of time fellowshipping with other people about God, but we don't spend a lot of time fellowshipping with God. And, and maybe God is shoving you into that position that is uncomfortable because He wants you to scream out to Him. That He wants you to get closer to Him. We used to sing a song years and years ago here. Uh, Sister Virginia sang it, The God on the Mountain is the same as the God in the Valley. And we, we used to sing that a lot. And I would argue that the God in the Valley is more God than the God on the Mountain. And here's why. Because we allow Him to be God then. It's, hey, God, I got it. Life's going great. I'll, I'll let you know if something goes bad. We treat God like a spare tire in your trunk. Now, maybe he's shoving you there because he's wanting to give you some things in this darkness that he can't give you in the light. Maybe he has to shove you in this bad, awful place so that he can teach you some things. And learn from those awful experiences. Nobody likes them. Nobody does. I, I don't like trials. Matter of fact, you're a little whacked in the head if you're into them. Like something wrong with you. But man, what we're going to get out of that and what we're going to learn from that cannot be learned in the light. Now, First Kings, you guys know the story. Here's, here's Elijah just had this major victory. Jezebel's like, yeah, enjoy your victory. I'm about to take you out. Well, then he allows this woman to make him scared. He goes, crawls off in a cave. God, I'm the only one left. And God says, 
and sends an earthquake, right? But God wasn't in the earthquake. God sends a fire. God wasn't in the fire. You know what God was in, though? That still, small voice that you're going to find in the darkness of your life. I, I, I got up this morning around 2.30. And I get up most mornings around 3.10. Well, literally every day of my life around 3 o'clock. And one of the reasons I do get up really early, especially on Sunday mornings, is because my house is quiet. There's no distraction. If I can leave that stupid phone alone for a second. And you sit there, and you can hear God. He sounds different in the darkness, without all the distractions. And maybe what God's trying to do is give you a still, small voice, and you won't listen. And so he has to shove you over here in the corner so he can talk to you a little bit. And the question is, are you going to focus on the problems of your life? Are you going to focus on the promises that he has given you? Number two, if you're going to be a Jacob, you're going to assume the conditions. If you're going to be a Paul, you're going to accentuate the positive. Matter of fact, they wrote a whole song about it. Well, you guys are rough this morning. You have spent way too long without somebody getting up in your grill to get just quiet, all right? Now, bottom line is, here we go. Jacob, what's he doing? Joseph is not. In other words, he's dead, right? Simeon is not. So he's dead. Now you're going to take Benjamin away. Now, is any of that true? No. Not one bit of it is true. It's all assumptions. And how many of our problems and our worries and our anxiety is based on stuff that's never going to happen? But what if happens if this? Or what if happens if that? What am I going to do if this goes on? We spend our life assuming. And for the most part, most of those worries don't even happen. I, I literally heard a lady tell Adrian Rogers one time, I, I know that worrying works because 85% of the stuff I worry about never happens. Now let that sink in. And how often do we do that? And we're just, you know, we're living in this situation where it's just assuming all this other stuff where Paul's saying, hey, we know that this is all working for the good. He's finding the positive in it. No different than what Jocko was doing when he was saying, okay, we didn't get this, good, then we can learn from it. That happened, fine, then I can grow from that. Look for the positive in your problems. Now, Job 13, 15 says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Is that your attitude? When life ain't going well? Do you really trust the Lord? And think about the positives of what he's done in your life? We just sang that song, He Hath Done Great Things. And every time we sing it, my mind literally goes, Yeah, we ain't seen nothing yet. The best is yet to come. Now that should be in the back of our minds so that we know no matter how bad the problem is, there's better days coming. Psalms 57, 1 through 3. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. And I will cry unto God my, the Most High. Unto God that performeth all things for me. Jacob's like, oh, this is against me. And actually what God was doing was doing every step he thought was against him for his own good. Matter of fact, if God didn't do that, he's going to die. Yet in that moment, he can't see it. Number three. Looking to blame versus looking for the blessing. Now, this is going to come natural for everybody in here. But I'm going to tell you, for me personally, I deal with this a lot at work. As soon as something goes bad, my first, my first inclination is, all right, who's to blame? Even if it's my fault, I've got to find a, like a, 
an outlet to go, well, yeah, that's my fault, but it's because you did this. This is how I live. And you go, not me. You sure? Watch this. You ever went back to, to Genesis? By the way, we'll read this in just a second. You go to Genesis here? God shows up, walk with Adam in the cool of the day. Adam's hiding. Adam, where you at? I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? I'm naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of that fruit I told you not to eat? Well, it wasn't me, God. It was that woman that you gave me. He blames God, or he blames the woman first, then he blames God. Now, every man in here understands that, how that works. Something goes bad, who are you going to blame first? It's got to be my wife's fault. And yet, that's our natural inclination. And if you go back to what Jacob said, here's what he said. Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me as to tell the men whether ye had yet a brother? In other words, why didn't you lie? You're the reason why we're in this situation. Not knowing that God is working all this behind the scenes. So here he is, looking to blame somebody, not looking for a blessing. Paul's saying, listen, we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. What Paul's looking for in the problem is, where's the blessing? Because we know it's all working for the good. Jacob's going, all right, who am I blaming? Now, how's that sitting with you? How do you handle problems? How much of that is landing on you going, yeah, you're right. I'm like Jacob. I, I look to blame. It's, just, it's a natural reaction. Do you know what the first step to getting saved is? To admit you're, that you're wrong. Because you can't get saved blaming others. You are in a situation where you are separated from a holy God from your own sinful nature. You have nobody to blame but yourself. And so God wants you to own it. That's all he wants you to do, own that thing. Now let me ask you something. I just went over these problems, right? Now I don't know which one's yours or how many of them you got, but can I ask you? How many of those problems are actually your own fault? I mean, you look at the financial. Most of the financial problems we have in life is our own fault. <laughs> You're going to get mad, but I don't really care. Most of our health problems are our own fault. Marriage, kids, parents, jobs. The anxiety you go through. Most of it is right there in your face. And maybe God's shoving you through that stuff to make you own some stuff. Got financial problems? Good. Maybe you'll learn through these financial problems. Maybe you will take an approach. You got health problems? Good. Maybe you take a new approach and eat different. Exercise more. Maybe stop doing other stuff. Maybe in all this stuff, you just take the approach and go, you're right, God, it's me. I'll own that. Maybe the problem goes away once you own it. Number four, being self-centered versus saint-orientated. All right, watch this. These problems on Jacob, if you're a Jacob, your focus is me, 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 me. We have a cat at the house who literally sounds like that. Me, me, me. That's her. And she's very selfish. As most cats are. But, but by the way, so are most humans. And we live in this situation where it's, oh, it's me. All these things are against me. All these problems are, are against me. And Paul, notice how Paul says this, because I want you to 
see this verse. We know that all things work together for the good to them. Notice he didn't say all things are working together for my own good. Now, now watch this. We have a tendency to go to Romans 8.28 and claim it and say, well, all these problems I'm going through, I know this, God's going to work it out for my good. That's not what the verse says. He says it's going to work out for them. So the question is, maybe God's going to shove me through the sewer for you to get a blessing out of it. Some of you would probably like to see that. So I was at Grace years ago, and Larry Brown was preaching a message called Cruel Crosses. And he was talking about how his wife was pregnant with twins and lost both of them. And they couldn't understand. They're young Christians. They, they, they're serving the Lord, and they're like, you know, here we are. We're going to church. We're doing the right thing. We're tithing. We're, we're, we're serving the Lord. Why would God do that to us? Years later, he's preaching, pastoring, and a lady who is pregnant goes to the hospital, loses a baby. And the wife of Larry goes in to, to comfort this lady, and this lady screams out. He goes, you have no idea what I'm going through. And she says, yes, I do. Matter of fact, I've had it twice. And so here it is, that day they realize you know, maybe God made us go through that so that we can be a blessing later on, years down the road. And so the question is, are you willing to be raked over the coals by God so that maybe you can be a blessing to somebody's life later on? I mean, we, we, we ask these questions. I mean, Rodney gets shot about a year or so ago. You know, we're all like, what in the world? Who knows what that event does in the future? I don't know. I, I'm not the one working the plan. But the question is, are you willing to go through that stuff for other people's blessings? Whether you ever get one or not. That's what it means to be saint-orientated and not self-centered. Job, you guys know the story of Job? You guys ever study that book? If you'll remember, this is a seven-day event where his friends, three friends and a sidekick, come in and just rake him over the coals. And do you know when God turned the captivity? Is when Job prayed for his friends. Most of the book is Job going, why me? Why me? What have I done? And then all of a sudden he gets to the end of the book and he realizes I'm in better shape than they are. And he begins to pray for his friends, and God realized that Job cared more about ministering to people than his own self, and God says, all right, now I'll flip the switch. And how often in our life, chaos and problems and trials come, and the first thing we want to do is drop ministry. Don't let anything stand in the way of you in ministry. Because whatever that is, God can remove. And maybe it's God shoving you through this because what he wants you to do is get off of being self-centered and getting focused on other people. Do you, do you know how much better you feel when you do stuff for other people than you do yourself? This is why, this is why shopping does not last. You go shop because you're down in the dumps and you go spend a bunch of money and you come home. How long does that high last? But yet if you do something for other people, it's just amazing how much that, that does so much better in our life because we're more focused on somebody else than ourselves. That's why the Bible talks about preferring one another over ourselves. Closing it up. Watch this, number five. Having self-solutions is what Jacob did versus realizing the sanctification process. Okay, so we go over here and Jacob's like, hey, 
All right, so he comes up with a plan here, and he says, And their father Israel saith unto them, If it must be so now, do this. Take the best fruit of the land in your vessels, carry it down uh, the man, and present a little balm, a little honey, spice, myrrh, nuts, almonds, and take a double money in your hand and money that was brought again in the mouth of the sack. In other words, give it all back, but give them way more this time. You know what he's doing, right? He's coming up with his own plan on how to solve the problem. How often do we do that? You got problems in your life? Who are you looking at to help you solve those things? Your own abilities? Your own mindset? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thy own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Don't come up with your own plan. Listen, guys, if, if you've got financial issues, God's given us a brain. It's called a budget. You, know, you put those things together, and it, it, it works wonders. But sometimes God shoves us in a financial issue from time to time because he wants to show himself strong. And so, therefore, we have to lean on him. I'm closing with this. You guys know what this is? This is David. That's a 17-foot-tall marble sculpture. It's in Florence, Italy. I want to go to Florence more than any other city in the world. It's just a really cool thing. Do you guys know the story behind this? So they're building this cathedral in Florence. 35 years before Michelangelo is even born. And what they've decided is we're going to carve out heroes of the Old Testament to be placed on the roof of this cathedral. And originally when they started, they were using terracotta, which is a cheap, you know, you guys have seen ter terracotta cheap. And then they'd paint it white to look like marble. And when you put it up on the roof, you couldn't tell anyway. So later on, the, the committee gets together and decides, you know what, let's really do God a favor and let's just make it out of marble. And so they bring in the first sculptor, and he's a famous guy, and I won't go into all that. He looks at this slab of marble that weighs 12,000 pounds. And he begins to look at it, and he says, no, it's got way too much imperfections. It's no good. It's worthless. Quit. Brings in another sculptor. He comes. He looks at it. Same thing. No, the... The, the, the impurities in this stone, it's no good. It's imperfect. I need something better to work with. So they shove this 12,000-pound slab of marble out in this courtyard, junkyard area, and it sits there for 35 years. All of a sudden, Michelangelo gets it. And he begins to carve what is considered the greatest sculptor, sculpture in history. The detail in it is so fine, which is interesting because it was going to go on top of the church, and you'd have never saw the detail. But you know what made Michelangelo the artist to be able to do it, not the other two? He could see the David inside the marble. He didn't care about the imperfections. He used those imperfections. And to this day, that thing, it's over 500 years old. It's inside of this piazza area that they've got. And do you understand, when God looked at you, he saw the imperfections. And most of the world had given you up on you and shoved you in a trash heap but God saw the imperfections and said, I can see what she's going to be or what he's going to be and not what he is. That's why Romans 8, 28 says all these things are working for the good. Why? Because we were predestined, not for heaven or hell, predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Now here's what's interesting. Michelangelo, when carving, knew it was going on top of the church, but the details mattered. Even though nobody else was going to see those details, it mattered to him. 
And even though most of your life, the details most people will never see, they matter to God. And what God does is chip away and chip away and chip away with fine, accurate detail. Because what he wants you to do is to look like the image he has for you, even though you don't look like that right now. They realize later on, getting a 12,000 pound sculpture on top of a roof is probably not a bright idea. And so now it's down at ground level and you can go and see all this detail. And do you understand there's coming a day when God will be done with you? And the detail will matter. And what he's doing is chipping away. And what you need to know is that my problems are not here to destroy me. My problems are here to conform me into the image of Jesus Christ. And so when I have these problems that come into my life, it has to start with good. Because God's doing a work. And what do I need to learn from this? And what does my attitude need to be like? And maybe a lot of the drama that we bring on ourselves would go away if we just stop and realize all this stuff is working for the good. You willing to do that? That is the Christian life. One problem, one trial, God taking you from faith to faith. As they come, Father, there's no doubt you're working on every one of us. And I know a lot of the problems in my own life I've created, and even though that I have brought that stuff in my own life, you are able to even work through those bad things to bring about good. God, help us today to look at our lives and to realize that these things aren't against us, but they are here working for us to bring us into the image of your dear son and help us to embrace the troubles and the problems and the trials and knowing what you're doing in our life. Maybe somebody's here today, God, and they, they're at their last wit's end and maybe they just need to come and talk to you about it. God, help them through this. In Jesus' holy, wonderful name we pray to you this morning. Amen. Stand to your